coming up next on The Health Hustle. I truly, truly, truly believe that a product like Stem Regen, supporting the release of your own stem cells, can li- really, literally, literally change the, the, the face of the earth in terms of health and wellness. I've just seen it too much. You're talking about stem cell technology, your repair system, probably the biggest discovery in medicine in our time. Uh, and now in a bottle, you can ship it to anybody, anywhere on the planet. We, we can literally change the face of the earth. So to me, there's a drive to, to really put that in the hands of as many people as possible. Of course, business development comes with that, but really to me, it's just like, it's, it, to me, it will be like a contribution from the heart. This is like almost like humanitarian. Let's just give everybody a chance to experience their maximum health. It was put on my plate. You know, I was 20 some years ago, this idea came, I'm starting to talk about it to people, and there's nobody that believes it. So if I believe it in it so much and nobody else believes in it, what do I do? Do I drop it? If I really believe in it, then, then I, have, I have to develop it. So, so it's really what, and now I'm talking about it almost like a, like a simple reflection, but when you're sitting with it and you realize this can change the world in terms of health, nobody believes it. It's almost like you're a traitor if you don't develop it. So, so I, I jumped in it and I developed it. If I were to choose something that I would like to do, uh, it would be more my life at the ashram, you know, that we talked about before. To me, to me, it's unavoidable. Look, look at the past 200 years. It, it's just a series of ideas after another ideas. And today is the culmination of all the ideas that we've had. We need to shift and just drop the ideas and just be. Just, just be there. Go from the mental man to the conscious man. Be there with what is, feel what is there, and f- develop a togetherness or a oneness that will, I think, lead us to a much different world. Hey, folks, and welcome to the Health Hustle of Austin, Texas. On this show, we uncover the big ideas from your fellow health and fitness entrepreneurs in the Austin, Texas area about how they built their business and the lessons they learned along the way. What's up, y'all? Corey here, and on this episode, I had a chance to sit down with Christian Dripio. Christian is a highly accomplished scientist and CEO with a wealth of experience in the field of adult STEM research. He holds a master's degree in neurophysiology and has been involved in medical research for 36 years, with 23 years specifically to get dedicated to stem cell research. Christian is the holder of seven patents, five issues, and two pending at this moment, author of five books, including the bestseller Cracking the Stem Cell Code, and has published 26 papers. In addition to his professional accomplishments, he has given 300 speeches and delivered 25 scientific lectures in 51 countries and is fluent in three languages. Christian has held a number of professional positions, including director of R&D at CellTech and Desert Lake Technologies, scientific advisor for Amazon Her Company and Jeunesse Global, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and chief scientist. Science Officer for STEM Tech International. He has founded five companies and currently is the CEO and founder of Calogen, which is a piece of what we get into on this episode. Some of the other things that we get into are the skills of learning how to actually learn, which was super fun for me. It's something I learned myself not that long ago. Why he quit his PhD program, what it was like living in a monastery. I was not expecting that, but had so much fun learning about that experience. The root of all thoughts, one could say it's fear or love. We get into that a little bit. The American versus Canadian mindset. So he's a a Canadian, so it was fun tapping into that a bit. Trusting your intuition, the challenges of getting a product to market, the journey of business, life-changing stories, the future of stem cell regeneration, and so much more. As a total side note, uh, there's a piece during the rapid fire question round where the audio cuts out for about five minutes. I apologize in advance for that. I'm not sure what happened, but I did get uh, the audio quality decently sounding well. I pulled some of the other audios of some backups that I had and also did a little bit of uh, some stuff that can maybe increase the audio quality. But just keep in mind, there's a short little snippet in there of five minutes where it's the audio flops, and so I apologize. One last thing, if you're a health or fitness professional and you're having difficulties getting leads, I have a free seven-step process that walks you through how to convert your social media following into paying clients. You can find the link in the description of this episode. Without further ado, mm, let's go. I think my first entrepreneurship business was uh was on accelerated learning what's that when i was when i was in my about 13 oh. i started to put into practice ways of learning fast and realized only later i would say in my early 20s uh, or mid 20s that people are not were not taught how to learn in school and it's only then that i realized with a friend of mine telling me she's going back to school 
and she's concerned that like she's stressed about it. I said, why, why are you stressed? She said, she have to, to sit in front of my text and read it over and over to learn it. And I said, is that what you do to learn? And then I just realized nobody has spent time learning how to learn. And I put a lot of time into developing these methods of, ex- of learning fast. And, um, and I realized nobody else did that. So I, I put that into a book, it's in seven languages right now. And at that time, I started to organize uh, conferences to teach people how to learn fast, like how you, how you can learn a language in a week, that kind of thing. How old were you at this time? I was uh, probably when I started to do this, I don't know, 20, when I started to do those lectures, maybe 26, okay. 25, 26. But I, I put it into practice between, let's say, 14 to 22, when I was in college. What was the name college. of the book? The first, the, the book that I wrote was in French is I Learned to Learn. Uh, and then, and then in English, it was learning can be fundamental. So, but all the other books uh, in different languages, it's in Romanian, Italian, Portuguese, German, Russian. It's all I learned to learn. The translation of I learned to learn. Have you ever read Made it, Make It Stick by I think it's Peter C. Brown? No. I wonder if it's very similar principles. It's funny that you say that because actually I didn't actually learn how to learn until I got to actually college slash graduate school. Uh-huh. All through like K through twelve, I had no idea the actual principles. I did. I made the mistake of what you exactly said is most people think that if you just read something again and again and again, uh-huh. that's how you memorize something. And it's actually not. No. That, that's actually mm-hmm. a very, I don't remember the exact terminology that he used, but he calls it like rote memory versus actually like deep knowledge memory. Because the difference between rote memory is like, yeah, you can hold on to it long enough to regurgitate it onto a test, but you don't hold on to it long term. Mm-hmm. It's actually the challenge and the difficulties of trying to recall the information where recall it actually becomes. Is everything. Exactly. Right, well, active yeah. recall is what he talks a lot about. I wonder yeah. if it's the same principles. Well, m- my my background was a book called Super Learning, uh, that was published, I guess, in the '80s, something like this. And and I uh, in French it was translated as the Fantastic Faculties of the Brain. So probably the, the 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 French translation of the title is probably what attracted me the most. I was always fascinated by the brain. My 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 sixth grade teacher told me years later. Uh, when I met him, just maybe what ten years ago, and uh, I went to Montreal and I invited him just to just to catch up. He was my favorite teacher, and he said, "I remember the first day in school." So this is my sixth grade, and he said, "The first question you asked was, Michelle, how does the brain work?" And he said, uh, "Let me let me check, and I'll come back to you, hmm. hoping that I would never come back." And I didn't, but th- but that's what I did. I went to study neurophysiology. I just wanted to understand the mind. So it kind of comes from fairly young. So at what thirteen, fourteen, I I see this book, The Fantastic Faculties of the Brain, and it was how the Russians, the Bulgarians, were so strong at the Olympics. What did they do to train? Uh, and its method that had been used in Bulgaria for accelerated learning and used in different setup for different things. And I'm going through all of this and I'm like putting them into practice. Most of them, most of them was a coach to a tra- to a, an athlete or a professor to a student. But when you're, al- when you're alone, how do you use these techniques? So I kind of turn them as to how do I use them myself to learn quickly? So that's really what I did out of these techniques. And I never really went outside of what I did with it. So, and then I moved on because I fell into, you know, stem cells and everything. And so have you always had a pretty inquisitive mind? I mean, is yeah, that... Yeah, that's, that's why I've evolved. That's why I'm a scientist. I'm yeah. born that way, yeah. Just curious about everything? Yeah. Do yeah. you ever find yourself, like, getting into, like, rabbit holes of, like, certain topics that you just, like, should not be going down? For myself? I mean, th- there's, there's an interesting story. I get, we can go into this at some point, which I don't know if I should not have got into it, but, but it, it led me to basically quit my PhD which was a, an article that I was... So it, it's a class where you had to write an article, uh, an essay, on one of the topics of a series of lecture that, that, that was given at the university, McGill University. And at the time, there was Ron Melzack with his theory of pain gate theory that mm. explained phantom limb pain. So you cut your arm yep. and you still have a, a pain in your, in your phantom limb. And his theory was, I'm summarizing it in a few words, but you have a... a, a brain perception matrix, sensory matrix, that should feel the arm that is no longer there, and you have an onto matrix, which is a conceptual representation of yourself with an arm, and the conflict between these two maps create pain. Hmm. And I was kind of saying, it's nice, but you're just kicking the can on the road. Like, now explain how these two conceptual matrix create pain. How did pain originate from, from that abstract conflict? You explain nothing. 
So you explain something just to create another problem to explain it. So I said, why don't you just say we don't know? Hmm. And then uh, and then I went on to say, well, let's try to find what it is. And I started to bring things like in, psycholo- in, in books of psychiatry, Journal of Psychiatry, they describe how kids, uh, if they get a, a wood leg or, or an artificial leg, like they lose their leg after age seven, uh, they don't feel anything. But if you get a, a kid younger than seven getting an artificial leg, the kid is seen climbing trees, and you ask him, you know, how, how can you climb trees? He says, I feel the branch under my, my, my wooden foot. And it's because you acquire your etheric body later in life by age seven, so it wraps up basically the prosthesis. Hypotheses. I don't know what it is. All I'm saying is I'm lining up scientific data like for example if you if you touch the table you can tell this is not wood some people can even just touch the wood and tell you this is maple this is cherry wood your fingers your neurology cannot do that all you have is 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 uh, is sensors for pain heat pressure that's mm. all you have in your skin you can you do not have the the sensory ability to have the the dexterity that we have in sensing so where do we sense how can a blind man touch I'm not saying every one of them, but it's reported in the scientific literature. You touch something and you can tell the color just by touch. How, how do you have documented in the scientific literature a math teacher who starts to have migraines, gets an MRI, and they discover he has one millimeter of cortex ar- along the skull, and the rest is water. The guy is a pure water head, and he's a professor of math. A little awkward, uh, as d- described in, in the literature, but still a math teacher. So that means... Your, the brain is not what we think it is. So you put all of that into this article, which was basically to say, maybe we need to take a, a view that is a little bit broader than just looking at, at the brain. The brain is an interface, interface between who we are as a presence and something else elsewhere. Anyway, I wrote that paper and, and I was told uh, to withdraw the paper uh, or they would, they would fail me. And that's just like, so I had long Damn. discussions with them, uh, and they, at the end of each discussion, they could not reject the argument, real or not. It was scientific and backed up with scientific literature. And after a while, they said, the teacher doesn't want to talk to you. Just withdraw your paper, write another one. And then the, the dean said very kindly, he said, just wait to have your PhD before you, you have an opinion. <laughs> and for, for the, honestly, for the purest scientist, this 19-year-old kid, purest scientist, it was just like, that's it. It was like stab in the back or in the heart. You know, I lost all interest into what I was doing. And after a while, I realized at the same time, uh, studying reincarnation, starting to tap into all of this and studying memory in rat brains and cat brains. If I know that your brain dies and is eaten by the worms, and then later on you have memory of these past life, past life that means they're not in the brain. So where are they? So, as you, as, as, so going into all that rabbit hole, uh, realizing that if I want to understand the mind, it's not in neurology, it's not in, physio- in neurophysiology. So I left the PhD and I went to live in, a, in an ashram, in a monastery. Really? For how long? I was there for about six months. And then the, the master's, the PhD that I turned into a master was rejected because there was just too much stuff in it for a master. So I, I kind of reduced it just for a master. It passed, and then when I was ready to go back, then the word was, no, we need you in the world. And then, and then that's when I was hired by this company in America. Okay, I would have never in a billion years guessed that you spent some time in a monastery. What can you maybe teach us about that, or what did you learn, and what was your experience like? Were you basically just, like, meditating all day? Like, what were you doing exactly? So for the record, we've officially started because, like, you totally encapsulated me, which is, like, the original conversation that we had. It's not okay. how I normally start the show, okay. but I'm just, like, so interested in this right now that we're just going to keep going with okay. this journey. But okay. I, I think, yeah, I would want to okay. know more about this monastery, seriously. The, the understanding of it obviously evolved, you know, over, over the years, over the decades, I should say. Uh, but if I, if I am to encapsulate it... Um, it's the fact that if, if, you, if you meditate, let's say you watch your thoughts, if you can calm them enough so that you can not engage with them, and then you take one that passes, you just grab it, and you just stay with it. You don't do anything with it. You don't judge it. You don't evaluate it. You don't do anything with it. You just look at it. You will see where it's coming from. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to see. You, you, you sense it. You know where this thought is coming from. And if you follow it deep enough, they all come from fear. Hmm. If you were fearless, you would have no thought. Your thought are all generated to protect you against 
an illusory fear that we're creating in our mind. We get caught, we get revealed, our secrets are revealed. We're afraid that something that we want to happen does not happen, or we're afraid that something that we want hap- that, that we don't want to see happen happens. And if you look, if you watch those stories, that's what we have all the time. So the point of meditation, and that was the whole work that was there, is to, is to go deep to really discover how if you stop the mind, you really discover an identity that, that is far beyond anything that you, that you could dream with your head before. So that's really the work, is to sit down and then, and then discover who you are behind the identity that in today's life we've all adapted, adopted, I should say. It's, it's, it's your traumas, it's your bad, your bad memories, it's the good things you've done, the bad things you've done, the things you're afraid of, the scars that have been left in. It's, at the end, if you, t- if you, if you look back, who you are to the world is just accumulation of bits and parts that, that you cherish mm. or that you're afraid of, one of the two. And that's your story, but you're much bigger than that. And you discover this when you stop your thoughts. I, uh, I got dinner with a friend last night and we were talking a lot about this topic as well. It's just like how at the core, at the starting point of all this stuff that we're talking about of like change really in life really starts at that piece of awareness of like where it all comes from. Mm. That's interesting that you say that you feel like a lot of it's it's rooted in fear because like even the other side of that too is like I've always questioned too is like sometimes I feel like it's also could be rooted in love right is like the I mean, desire when, for love I guess I mean it's it's a very it's a very interesting point because you I think that your desire for love is to a large extent your fear of not having it true you, because you have it for sure you are love. the yin and the yang it's it's your it's your nature when stops when thought stops what you discover is 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 your true nature. When when the day that I married my wonderful wife, I got a it was at at, a, at an ashram, and I I mean God gave me a beautiful gift because at that moment during the ceremony, we all read and hear you know everything is love. These are nice phrases you know we can accept the idea, but where is it as an experience? And I'm sitting there, actually standing, and suddenly in one moment I look around and. And all the colors are so vivid, and everything is just a different texture. And I'm starting to look at all of this. And suddenly I realize, wow, if I am to look at everything, everything is made of the same thing. Mm. It was made out of love. It was, I'm telling it to you today, and it's, it's theoretical right now. When I say it, you know, it's just like everything that I've read before. But in that moment, it was the deep experience. It is love. So when you don't experience it, it's because we cover it with something else. Totally. Otherwise, that's the true nature. That's your only nature. Totally. It's, it's, it's joy and love. That's what we're made of. This is not normally how this show goes, <laughs> but you're just so fascinating <laughs> that I just like want to continue to dive down this conversation so deeply. But before we do, I kind of want to pull back a little bit about you were talking about how you got a lot of pushback from some of your teachers or professors when you were putting out some of this research that you were working on. Did you then decide to kind of continue to go down the researching route or was that kind of the moment where you realized that you like you wanted to start doing your own thing because like obviously they just weren't understanding where you were at at that point? I I don't think that I had uh, that kind of drive when I was younger. My drive was really just curiosity and, and I am by I mean by by design with no effort, value, desire. I'm just, a, I'm a scientist. Mm. I've approached everything like a scientist, it's just what I do. So as soon as something shows up in my life, the scientist gets in, 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 into play, if you want. <laughs> so I don't think that I chose to do any of it. It's just the only thing that I, that I was, that was easy for me to do. So, so I went to the monastery, I came out, um, I wrapped up this, this, this PhD into a master, uh, and then I was told, no, we, you know, I, I need you, the, 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 the leader of the ashram said, I need you in the world. And then he said, he said he, you know, I'll, I'll send you to America. He oh, wait, said, pause. Where, was, where were you at with the monastery? Where it was it? in France. Okay. It was in the south of France, in, Got it. in the French Alps. Got it. Wow, wild. Pause. How was that? Pretty amazing? It was okay. <laughs> in the mountains. Yeah, yeah that would be incredible. Amazing. Cool. It was. Okay. It was uh, with somebody that spent years, you know, living in cave. And I mean, the, the real, the real deal and the real story. It was. It was. Uh, it was a, a fascinating time of my life for yeah. sure. Um, but he basically says, uh, said to me, uh, and of course at the time, you know, I'm hearing it, but you know, what does it really mean? Uh, he said, I'm, I'm sending you to America. I'm, I'm living in Montreal. I mean, I've traveled like maybe once or twice outside of the country. Uh, I have no 
in my mind, there's like, I'm Canadian. I'm, I'm, I'm French Canadian. This is, anyway, America is not in my scope. And he said, okay. He said, um, I'm sending you to America. He said, you'll travel a lot. He said, a lot. A lot. <laughs> and then I have 2.5 million air miles today. So I have traveled a <laughs> lot. And uh, so I'm sending you to America. And then he gave some instruction, which at the time I really did not fully understand. Uh, but I came back and three weeks later, I got a phone call and this American company wanted me to head their research department on this plant that they were selling at the time, Blue Green Algae from Klamath Lake. And, and I moved to America. How did they find you? I, I gave a lecture. I, I was... So I did accelerated learning, and um, so I, I know because I applied it with myself, I know how to teach to, uh, teach to make people learn very quick. Uh, and it, it has a lot to do with the storytelling. Like when you teach something, make it into a story, everybody, there's a lot of things to do with information to make people learn it easily. So distributor of this product in Montreal um, needed to understand the product more. So they invited me to, not knowing what I was doing, to attend one of these conference. And I just, I just thought, man, you know, if, if you let me, I can teach you what your product does, you know, for you. And uh, so I gave one lecture and then I was asked to give another one and, and it became like a weekly thing. And somebody shared with this American company, we have somebody in Montreal who, you know, you should look at him. He can really help the company. Uh, and that's how they, I traveled there. I gave a lecture in, in Klamath Falls, I think in August, 94. And then, uh, and they offered this to me in January, uh, 1995 to, to move there. My, my English was awful at the time. I oh, mean, really? I, I went to McGill, but I, mean, I grew up French. I went to McGill, but I mean, I literally learned English on the, on the bench at the university. The first three weeks, I have a dictionary and I'm just hearing some of the words and going at night and reading in, in books with a dictionary about the things that I think I heard during the day. And uh, so that's how I learned English. Why did you have so much trust in coming to America? Because that's such an audacious thing to just like trust this person at the monastery on top of the fact that you don't even speak English at the time. I mean, I, I was, b by the time I came here, I was speaking it. I just had a terrible accent. Got it. You know? Half of the people would laugh and ask me, what did you just say? Yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, uh, I, I think I will go back to what I just said before. I don't think it was uh, courage, audacity or whatever. I think it's just, it's just it, si it sounded right. It felt yeah. right. And I just went with it. And from the day that I arrived in America, I must say that for the first time I felt home. Like mm. It's almost like the American way, it's very different. A, a, a Canadian mind is different from, a, from an American mind in terms of uh, the, the guts, in terms of the, I don't know, the drive, and in terms of the, the, the taking chances. And can, Canadian are, are a little bit more laid back. So when I arrived here, I just felt, I just felt very comfortable. I never, never once did I look back to, to going back to Canada. Do you feel that way in Austin as well, in general? Is that why you ended up here? I did not end up here because of that, but, but from the moment, I mean, we were in, in California and my company was moving to Florida. Nothing against Florida, but it's not for me. So I'm looking at where else can I go that is a no-tax state. And uh, the company was moving in Florida for that reason. And, uh, and my wife had a call back. She's an actress. Uh, so she had a call back for a movie in, in Austin. And she came back. So we, we sold our house. We have, at the end of the month, we need to be out of California. And we don't know where we're going. So she comes back and she says, you need to, baby, you need to visit Austin. And <laughs> I'm, I'm Canadian. So I said, I'm not going to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so we flew in on the Thursday evening. I landed. I look at the city. The feel of the city was just like, was amazing. Yeah. So by uh, 3, 4 o'clock on Friday, we had a, an offer on a house, and we got it on Saturday morning, and we, and we moved in. And it's so far the best place that I've lived. So, so the, the feel of Austin is, is I, I love it. Love that. I want to go back to something you said a little bit ago about trusting your intuition, which I feel like is an interesting phrase coming from a scientist. Mm -hmm. Have you always been somebody that kind of like trusts their intuition? Have you, is that something you're just like really tapped into? And does that come from maybe your experience at the monastery or have you just always been like that? No, I think I'm born like that. Um, everything is wrapped up into like the research attitude, the research, um, how, how could I call it? The research method. 
All I will say is that to that research method, I'm not limiting it, limiting it to instruments, which is normally what science is doing. Let me give you an example. Is, does love exist? I sure hope so, yeah. Uh, of course it exists. How can you measure love? Do we have a scientific instrument to measure it? Therefore, scientifically, it does not exist. Hmm. How could we deny it? I mean, it's the greatest force in the world. Scientifically, it has no existence. So just extrapolate this. There's a lot of things that scientifically we can't measure, and yet you know that they're contributing to the reality that you're observing. And it's probably why it led me to discover, you know, what I discovered with stem cells. It's not in the literature. Nobody's accepting it. It's not part of the, of the language. And yet it's right there it's staring at you. It's obvious that, you know, your stem cells are there and they're playing an absolute, an absolutely vital role in the body. So, so that kind of attitude of just like looking and, and sensing that there's something there, uh, to me, is more valid than what the instruments are going to say for a while then you need to kind of, you need to support it with what the instruments and the right scientific approach will do. But um, yeah, I've, I've, I've done pretty much always things on, on, my first step is on intuition, and then I back it up with the science. That's far better than what I can say. I'm terrible at trusting my intuition. I'm pretty much just like a bulldog and just like move forward <laughs> regardless. So I kind of, I can definitely respect that a lot. Um, and side note, I, uh, it's funny, I was listening to a lot of your other stuff and I know a lot about what you talk about in terms of like the stem cell stuff. And you were talking about how like mid thirties is kind of when people generally start getting injuries and et cetera. And so the fact that you brought me some product because I'm literally in my mid thirties and literally dealing with like a knee injury as I train for this marathon right now, it was like, so talking directly to me it was hilarious of like yep i know exactly what you're talking about like mid 30s is kind of that time of like less stem cells less recovery less mm -hmm. repair and so i can totally resonate with exactly a lot of the stuff that you talk about so thank you i honestly appreciate you bringing the stuff for that but pleasure we can i can give you more uh you know in line to with what you're just saying you know i was i remember when we started our first sort of marketing um think tank uh, about stem regen i was with our team in malaysia and I'm at the table, and it's a young team, and I'm, I'm really looking around, and I'm thinking, the average age is probably 22. And there was <laughs> one 40-year-old. So th there were a few probably that were 17, 18. And they're trying to shape the message around stem regen, around a product that releases your stem cells. And they're just not getting it. And at some point, I'm saying, okay, tell me here, who in this group here gets up in the morning and is thinking about their health? <laughs> and obviously, they're staring at me like they have no clue what I'm talking about. And I'm saying there's a point in your life, past mid-30s. That was this morning for me, well, my you, knee. <laughs> you'll, you'll get up in the morning, and every morning you'll get up, and health will be on your mind. Yeah. Something is reminding you that you're not top. Yep. And, um, <laughs> and that's when your stem cell, you start to experience that when the number of stem cells has passed a certain threshold in your body. It happens in your 30s. Well, fuck. Because, <laughs> like, literally, for the last, like... Probably like two, three weeks now, like I've been waking up, like feeling the knee pain. And so like the fact that we're having this conversation right now is like the timing is hilariously perfect. But uh, so I want to dive into a little bit more of that. So like I feel like we've unless we missed anything along that journey, like because like can we fill in the, maybe the interim a little bit of like. So you came to the States, you started working for this company, you started doing some research and figuring out like some of the products that can help with stem cell before probably you started this business. No, I, I'm like working. I'm working. So I'm hired to study. So, so the DSHEA, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, was just passed in 1994, and it forced companies promoting dietary supplements to have scientific data to support any claim that they're, used, that they're making. So that's really why I was hired, to start to study what this blue-green algae from Climate Lake was doing in people's health uh, and provide the scientific documentation to support their claim. Mm -hmm. The main claims were support of immune function, support of mental clarity, and then, uh, and then uh, anti-inflammation. So we click, quickly identified that the blue-green algae, like other blue-green algae, contains a blue pigment that is a potent anti-inflammatory agent. We documented a polysaccharide that supports the immune system. And AFA is a very unique source of phenylethylamine, which is also known in chemistry as the molecule of love. Your brain makes it when you feel content, when you feel good. You know, yesterday you had financial problem. Today, you don't think about them. You're doing like you're painting, you're running, whatever. You're in the zone. You feel great. Tomorrow, your financial problem will come back. But right now, they're not in your life. Like, mm. you're happy. Like, none, none of this really matters. Your brain is making PEA. 
blue green algae was a source of that and a lot of people consuming it that's what they would report they said i have this feeling of energy mental clarity and i feel just like content so so we documented all of that but as i'm doing all of this i come across cases of people who reversed multiple sclerosis insulin dependent diabetes heart disease emphysema parkinson alzheimer's liver failure so the question is what is this thing doing to support kidney function liver function pancreatic function heart function lung function the brain the skin the joints in nature you don't have something that touches so many aspects of human health so it was it was a mystery for a number of years until the early days of stem cell research when scientists started to observe that stem cells had the ability to go in various tissues and becoming cells of various tissues. The first observation that I was aware of was how stem cells can go in the brain and become brain cells of all, of all tissue. I'm a neurophysiologist. Like anybody in the field of brain research, we were told that you do not make new brain cells. And now studies are showing that stem cells can go to the brain and become a brain cell. So I go in the literature and I see another paper describing how stem cells could become heart cells, another one, liver cells. These were those that I could find early 2001. So I just start to think, well, if stem cells can become heart, liver, and brain, why not lung, pancreas, and skin, and the rest? It makes no sense that they just become those three and not the rest. So they have to become the rest. It's just a matter of time. And if they do, it has to be their role in the body. How do you have a stem cell that goes to the brain and you say, oh, that's a fluke? You know, a weird stem cell. No, if, if, if that happens, that's because it's their role. So they are the repair system. So I published an article in a journal, Medical Hypothesis, suggesting stem cells are the repair system of the body. And in the back of my mind was, what if that plant just supports the release of stem cells? And if it's the repair system, then they will go into the heart of the heart patient, the pancreas of the diabetic, the brain of the Parkinson, the lung of the emphysema patient, and so on. So it would explain the mechanism of action. So we bought a flow cytometer, big machine to count stem cells, count particles. And then we started to develop the assay and start to count stem cells. So we started with ourselves first. And we'd take, we'd take a blood sample, take the product, then take another blood sample an hour, two hours, three hours later. And we discovered that's what happens. Within a few hours of consumption, you, you, your bone marrow release, releases a wave of stem cells, which then go and repair various tissues. They tap into, they, they boost your repair system, your ability to repair. Hmm. So that was the beginning. That was the start. Now, everything that I did before shifted, and I just went into the field of stem cell research. And how did the beginning of this product even start? Can, we, can you maybe give us like maybe the short story of like how you even get a product like that into the market? That seems like that'd be a big hurdle. Well, the first, so after, after we documented that this, this blue-green algae was stimulating stem cell research, then we finalized the science, filed the patents. Then at the time in, this early, in these early days, the question is, okay, you have something that increases stem cells, but so what? What does it mean? It means nothing. So we had to show that it means something. Right. We had to use injury models to show we enhance uh, repair. Uh, you need, in, this, in the early days, we had to show the mechanism of action, the active compounds. We had to do all of this in order to, to really prove that this is real. So once all of this was done, we are in 2003. Uh, so I, I start to go out and, and talk to other existing companies as to, to, to basically get this product as a new product for a completely new uh, application. Uh, I remember very well the day that all of this kind of came in, in my mind. It happens like, like fairly quickly. After, after looking at all the literature, it, it came very quickly in my mind that that's it. We've discovered that the body has a repair system. Just like you have an immune system, a cardiovascular system, you have a repair system. I mean, it changes everything. What you want, you want to breathe better. What do you do? You support your respiratory system. You want better blood glucose m metabolism. You stimulate your endocrine system. What if you want to have better repair and better health? You support your repair and health system. That's your stem cells. I looked at this and honestly, the honest thought in my mind was, that's it. We put an end to disease. I mean, I remember in those days, I, I thought it was so fabulous what we had. We, the scientific community, had discovered stem cells or the repair system of the body. 
But then it's, I started to just butt head with everybody, with the, with the, the attorneys that said, no, stem cells, the, the FDA will shut you down. Stem cells are a disease. I'm telling him, no, it's a normal function of your body. It's totally fine. You're supporting the immune system and you're supporting your stem cells. It's the same thing. But they did not believe it. The scientists would say more stem cells in circulation, it really means nothing. And above all, stem cells don't become cells of other tissues. So we were really facing the, these walls. So that's where we basically turn around and decide, okay, we'll do it ourselves. And that's really when my entrepreneurship started. So we created a company and we just launched that on the marketplace. So the first stem cell product was launched in 2005. Would you say that the biggest hurdle then is actually getting just the education out about the product so people understand it? Or what would you say has been like the biggest challenge or hurdle in terms of like getting this product to market? It was. In the early days, it was entirely, you know, education of, of, of the people and having to answer to all the so-called experts who are coming out on the web and telling you <laughs> that this product is a scam because mm -hmm. you know stem cells don't become brain cells what do you do now you go and you start to argue you show the literature nobody reads the literature people just right. listen to an opinion right. so, so at the end it's really an uphill battle to really provide that education, hence the 2.5 million air miles. Have you, yeah, <laughs> which I wanna ask you what your, before I do, uh, what your favorite travel location is. But before I do, so then have you leaned more heavily on like testimonials and just like the people talking about the yep. product that have had experiences with it? Yeah, that's, th th that's the reason why we basically shifted our approach and basically went directly into network marketing. There's, if, if nobody accepts it, if, if you cannot get the message across, then just have people share their experience. And the company grew, I mean, exponentially very fast because of the stories that people had. I mean, people had stories. I have seen so many lives being changed. I don't know how many people came to see after a lecture, tears in their eyes, telling them how their life have been changed. I've heard so many of them. It is by far the greatest compensation of, mm. of doing all of this. It's just, just how it changes. It, it has changed lives and continues to change lives. So that's how it started. This is, this is a pretty generic question. And the reason I ask it is because like even from like something like this podcast show is like sometimes I'll, I'll get people that like reach out or connect or run into me or whatever from listening to the show and just like get a lot of value out of it. Actually, most recently somebody reached out to me and they told me like they listen to the show every single day on their way to work before actually deciding to finally branch off and do their own thing. And they just like totally owed it all to me and they were so grateful and whatever. And it's moments like that, that just like feel really good. Like that could fuel me for forever. So I'd be curious as to like your experience with that. Like it's kind of a gener generic question, but like, do you have any like notable stories of people that have said something to you or has there been moments that's just like have really stood out? There's so many, I mean, I'm talking thousands here, like so many but there are two that, that stay there in my mind, and they're not there because they were by themselves fantastic. They were just like so emotional in nature. So one, I'm in Mexico, and then, um, so I learned Spanish to be able to lecture in, in Mexico and in, in the Hispanic world. And uh, so I give a lecture, and at, at the end of the lecture, this father comes to see me with his daughter, she was maybe nine, and, uh, and he started to talk about how his daughter was bullied in school because she had vitiligo. So she had many places in her body, these white spots. She was relatively, relatively uh, dark. And, um, and she was bullied and she was, I mean, she was depressed and she was just not doing well. And then she started to take the product and then he asked his daughter, take off your sandal. And there was left maybe the size of a pea on top of her foot. Everything else on her hand, arms, everything was gone. And you should see the face of that girl. It mm. was just like, so just to see what that meant in the life of that girl, you know, I'm talking about it, I still have goosebumps. Yeah. It was not by itself. Like, it's not like a story where somebody came out of, from the dead, but, but it was, that, that story stuck with me. Another one, I was in, um, uh, in Martinique. We had a big market, market in Martinique. And uh, this gal stood up and she says, I will speak for my sister uh, because she's too shy to speak. Mm. But she said, I have my older sister, but I must say I've never had a sister. So her sister had schizophrenia. I'm not going to tell you that it's a, it's a, it's a field where these products have an effect. Actually, it, I think it's the, the only case that I've heard about. But the story itself that I remember is that she said, I never had a sister. My sister was somebody that I had to always watch because she could hit me, she could stab me, she could, uh, my friends would not come home. I never hugged my sister because I was afraid that she would bite me or, so I never had a sister. 
And then she started to take your product. And she said, for the past six months now, every day I hug my sister. And I have, this product gave me back my sister. I think it's the only story that made Damn. me cry. And, um, and, and then in between, we've got everything. We have quadriplegic getting mobility. We have everything, everything. Well, yeah, it's not chilly in here. It's hot in Texas. I definitely got the chills, though. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, what would you say to kind of like play on the other end of this scope of what's maybe been... Oh, actually, I wanted to ask that question before I do. What was the favorite place that you've traveled to? Of all the traveling that you've been, what's at the top of the list? I've done probably about, what, 60, 65, 67 countries. And I would say that the Southeast Asia, like that bend that goes from... Uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, yeah. that bend there is probably where that feels almost like home for me. I was hoping you'd say Austin, friends. Texas. I don't know. Austin, but I don't travel there. <laughs> I live there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so what's maybe like, I was going to say, what's been the maybe most expensive mistake you've made? And that could be monetarily or emotionally. It was both. Um, and it, it was, I wouldn't say that I learned it because... I always worked like this. It was always something important to me, but I guess I disregarded it, and it, it was the biggest mistake. And it's it's the people that you associate with. Hmm. Like you, oftentimes younger, you look at the outcome, and somebody is promising an outcome. Somebody has a set of skills that makes you dream of, of an outcome, and you buy the outcome. And you can tell from the beginning that there are a set of values that don't really work with your own values and it's hey this world is there's diversity you don't need to have somebody that has your same values let's suppress all of that and let's just say no we'll make it work and and we because i want the outcome and it's to really realize that you don't get into business with anybody because of the outcome it's for the journey mm. the outcome comes out of the journey and if you don't choose the right people for the journey you never get the outcome that you were dreaming out you know, to begin with. And it's, it's almost like I knew it, but after doing this once or twice, I just learned the lesson. Just don't do it. The, the, the dream of the outcome is, is not real. It will not happen how you think of it. So work with, with nice, work with people that you're really comfortable with, that have the same value as you. Take your time in choosing your partners because they will make your life miserable. Yeah, I think that's incredible advice that a lot of people can learn from. I have had a lot of people on the show and I could say that's a common answer in regards to just like really vetting the people that you want to do a long-term journey with. Because you're right, it's it's about the journey, not the outcome. So I love yeah. that. Where do you see things going then? Like what is the future of everything moving forward of like, is it just like continuing to grow as a business? Is it to continue to change more lives? Is it reformulating? Like what's the, what's the future I mean, ahead? From a business standpoint, I truly, truly, truly believe that a product like stem regen, supporting the release of your own stem cells can literally, literally, literally change the, the, the face of the earth in terms of health and wellness. I've just seen it too much. You're talking about stem cell technology, your repair system, probably the biggest discovery in medicine in our time. Uh, and now in a bottle, you can ship it to anybody anywhere on the planet. Mm. We, we can literally change the face of the earth. So to me, there's a drive to, to really put that in the hands of as many people as possible. Of course, business development comes with that. But really, to me, it's just like, it's, it, to me, it will be like a contribution from the heart. This is like almost like humanitarian. Let's just give everybody a chance to experience their maximum health. Um, and then some of the products and development. But, but I'm doing this. I mean, what I'm going to say sound maybe strange, but it was put on my plate. You know, I was 20 some years ago. This idea came. I'm starting to talk about it to people. And there's nobody that believes it. So if I believe it in it so much and nobody else believes in it, what do I do? Do I drop it? If I really believe in it, then, then I, have, I have to develop it. Mm. So, so it's really what, and now I'm talking about it almost like a, like a simple reflection, but when you're sitting with it and you realize this can change the world in terms of health, nobody believes it. It's almost like you're a traitor if you mm. don't develop it. So, so I, I jumped in it and I developed it. If I were to choose something that I would like to do, uh, it would be more my life at the ashram, you know, that we talked about before. To me, to me, it's unavoidable 
look look at the past 200 years. It, it's just a series of ideas after another ideas. And today is the culmination of all the ideas that we've had. We need to shift and just drop the ideas and just be. Just, just be there. Go from the mental man to the conscious man. Be there with what is. Feel what is there. And f- develop a togetherness or a oneness that will, I think, lead us to a much different world. Not by just adding the next great idea. So, so that's probably where, in my heart, that's probably where I would like to get involved more. Damn, man. I'm excited. You're a visionary. That's honestly beautiful. I have a, a round of rapid fire questions for you. So it's really just like whatever the first things that come to mind. You ready? So the first one is, what's your best business advice? What we just talked about before. Take your time. Just jump on anything, on, on, on partnership. Just take your time to choose your partnership. And probably one of the biggest mistakes that I have done and I see people do you want to do something, and yet the universe has a different timing. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you wait for a train, you know, if you walk up off the platform when the train is not there or the door is not open, you're missing it. There's a moment when the door opens, life is like this. There's a moment for everything. Just be patient. Just work with the flow of, of this cosmic dance, and you'll be so much more successful than just trying to, to demolish closed doors. Just wait when they open says a lot about your knack for intuition, my friend. What's your favorite part about entre- entrepreneurship? To me, it's, it's creation. It's just creating things that are, were not there, ideas, that projects that were not there, and just like give them birth. I, I just, it's probably what I like the most. I like that. What's your best marketing advice? Everything is marketing. Hmm. From a scientist who spent a lot of years thinking that the substance is what mattered, you know, explaining it, having the science, and really having learned that, yeah, you need to have it. I need to have it for what I do. But once that is done to the world, what matters is just good marketing. I appreciate seeing, hearing that as somebody who does marketing. So that's good. <laughs> uh, when are you the most productive? When I have a tight deadline and I'm under pressure. Who is your inspiration? All the people who did things not for themselves, but subtracting themselves from the problem. Gandhi, so on. Gandhi, good pick. Uh, tell me one secret or just something that most people don't know about you. It's probably, it's no longer a secret. It's, it's like most people who work with me, I have no clue that I meditate every morning and, and my real drive is, is not the science. So now it's too late. <laughs> the secret is out. <laughs> um, what would you change about yourself, if anything, for that matter? If I could be more of an extrovert, um, it would probably have made my life much easier. Interesting. Okay. I, I mean, it, it, you may not see it. People may not see it now. And that's actually the first thing that I did with all these accelerated learning techniques. The first thing was like, I'm way too shy. I mean, this has to change. And, and I use these methods to change that. But it stayed. Like, I'm, I'm fundamentally an introvert person. If I go in a room with like 100 people and I'm not with my wife, at the end of the evening, I may have talked to nobody and I'm totally happy with it. <laughs> My wife is there. I have talked to the 10 most influential people in that room, and she maintains a great relationship with them, and she makes all of it so easy. So I need an extroverted wife, what you're telling me. There you me. go. Because I'm just like you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's funny. I'm a total introverted heart. Nobody ever believes me, but it's like, yeah, I spend about 90% of my day alone, and I have no problem with that I could, I could be alone all the time, but I'd be totally happy with it. <laughs> um, what's your favorite app or resource that you're using right now? It's hard to tell because uh, because I'm very new to all this, you know. I mean, we're talking social media. Probably the question is broader than that. Let's say BrainTap. What's Brain that? Tap. BrainTap is, a, is an app or a device that basically taps into uh, the ability to synchronize your brain. Is it like a flow state thing? Sort of. It's, 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 it's headset, and then you have meditations or, or programs mm-hmm. that you follow with lights. And it basically puts your brain into, let's call it neuroplasticity. What you try to do with all kinds of exercise in life, you can do very quickly by, by triggering neuro, neuroplasticity in your brain just by doing the programs that are into this, into this app. It's a, it's a great system. Hmm. I'll check it out. Uh, when were you the happiest? I think joy is everywhere. So I, so I would say I'll try it in the next minute to be my happiest. Love that. Uh, what's your favorite part about Austin? And you can't say the people. I know I can't say the people. Everybody says the people. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, let me cheat a little bit. If I don't say the people, I would say 
It's just the atmosphere that just invites collaboration to a degree that I have never seen anywhere. So, so it is the people, but I would say if I go one layer, one layer beyond this, uh, everywhere I am in the business world, you keep your secret for yourself. You know, whatever works for you, you kind of keep it. You're, I came in Austin. We really launched in Austin, STEM Regen, like just a little bit over a year ago. And I just discovered a community that, that was sharing and was open to a degree that I've never seen anywhere. So it's the openness. And I know it goes back to the people I cheated. With. No, you didn't. That's beautiful. I, I honestly can resonate with that a lot. It's the first place I've ever lived where I feel like everyone I meet just wants to help. They're there and they say, exactly, what can I do for you? Yeah. That does not happen in many places. It's wild. And it's, it's, it's sincere. Yeah. That's the biggest part of it. It is sincere. Totally. Yeah. Um, I have one last question. Before I ask that question, though, I just want to acknowledge you for always just like following your curiosities and continuing to pursue the things that you feel like are right in the world and trying to make a difference and obviously helping a lot of people and changing a lot of lives and continuing to do it despite pushback and just like obviously seeing how it's coming to fruition and a lot of great things are happening. I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I think it's great. Uh, before I ask my last question, though, what's your plug? Where can people find you? Uh, Kalyagen.com, K-A-L-Y-A-G-E-N. Dot com. So this is the website when you can get STEM Regen. Um, yeah, just send an email there. There's information. You can go on social media, STEM Cell Christian. Uh, when I started with Christian Drapo, everybody said, nobody will know how to spell Drapo. So we went for STEM Cell Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so on TikTok and, and, and Instagram. Uh, that's good marketing. Uh, and if anyone is in their mid-30s talking to myself right now, you might want to check it out. Uh, last question. It's really, what's your best advice to any other fitness, business, wellness owners out there? It's really just like the entrepreneurship community in that space, similar to you are. What's maybe like your best piece of advice to that person if they were to start over from ground zero of like what they should focus on, what they should be thinking about, and just like avoiding pitfalls, essentially? I would say... Um there's a lot that you can do at first with not necessarily a lot of money. So don't start with offices. Don't start, Just start with what you have right now. Social media, you know it way better than I because I'm a dinosaur with social media. <laughs> I don't think in all the business that I've done before, uh, it has never been as easy as it is today with social media. There's so much you, you can do with little money. And then just find, take your time, find the right partner to, to start it and, and support you. And um, I mean, if you start like this, I think, I think you can go far. Love that. Appreciate you being on the show. Thanks, man. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening to the show. If you have any feedback for me about the show or any other guests that you'd want to see in the show, definitely shoot me a message. I love engaging with my audience and figuring out how I can provide the best value possible to the people listening to this show. Before you go, I only have one ask of you, and that would be to check out my 3 Tips Tuesday newsletter. It's three marketing tips every Tuesday specifically for the health and fitness entrepreneur to help them attract new leads. If you press the link in the description, it'll take you directly to the archive of all my previous newsletters, and you can decide for yourself if it's something for you. If you end up finding it helpful, you can just sign up for the newsletter and you'll get it in your inbox every Tuesday. Thanks again and keep hustling, my friends.